After their first visit in 2007, Paul and Mickey Prince fell in love with South Africa and felt God calling them to minister to children, specifically those without a home or family. So being in the unique position of both being retired, they sold their house, their cars, and almost all of their belongings and moved to South Africa in February 2008 as second career missionaries. The Prince's ministry takes place in the Limpopo province of South Africa, outside the town of Feilwater. This is an area where there are many orphaned, abandoned, and abused children, yet no other children's home is meeting the need. After a lot of homework, Paul and Mickey purchased a 90-acre piece of property and in 2010 opened The Fold to feed, house, educate, and provide a future with hope for children affected by the AIDS epidemic. Paul and Mickey's vision is to create multiple independent homes on the property where children will grow up in a loving, supportive home environment. Their goal, to see the next generation of children love God, become successful members of society, and someday create a loving, supportive family environment for their children. Cedar Ridge already partners with Paul and Mickey Prince in South Africa and supports the ministry of The Fold on a monthly basis. But right now, The Fold is at maximum capacity. They desperately need additional space and additional staffing before they can take in any more children. Your participation in our Radical Faith Stewardship journey will provide the funds necessary for The Fold to build an additional household and make a difference in the South Africa orphan crisis. Yes, Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Hip, hip, hooray! Amen. <laughs> Isn't that a great clip of uh, Paul with the kids there? Uh, and uh, they're doing a great job in South Africa. I'm going to ask my friend Maddie Dudley to come up and join me right now. Maddie, would you do that? Maddie's the daughter, fourth grade daughter of Jeff and Andrea Dudley. And I've asked her if she would just come up and for us all say a prayer for what's going on in South Africa with the orphans. Would you do that, Maddie? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray today for the children in South Africa. And I pray for the children living in the fold. They are children just like us, and they need you and your son Jesus too. And I pray for the princes and their work. And I pray for their health and safety. And I pray for the people at this church to help the children living in the fold. In your son's name I pray, amen. Amen. Thank you, Maddie. Would you give her a hand? You know, what I love about our Radical Faith Project is that a great deal of it has to do with children. I don't know if you've noticed that or not, but when we start talking about our local outreach, what we're going to be doing as we add a campus in Kuwaita, you know the families that are going to be affected in the area around there, they've got kids. Uh, in fact, the neighborhood's full of kids. The parking lot often has kids uh, playing there. Uh, we have talked already about uh, our, our work in North Africa with Ryan and Jill, and uh, a great part of their work has to do with a physical therapy center that is geared towards children. And of course, what Paul and Mickey Prince are doing in South Africa is all about children. It's about orphan kids, uh, a, a lot of them in that situation because of the HIV AIDS crisis there. And here God is using us to impact them. And so it, it, a lot of what we're doing has to do with kids, and that excites me and I, I think is a wonderful thing. Our partners, Paul and Mickey Prince, you saw the video about them, are doing a great job. Uh, I was overseeing them. Uh, uh, this summer, and uh, uh, they just have a fantastic heart and ministry and outlook upon what God is going to do, and it's a major component of our radical faith uh, stewardship journey that we are in the process of right now. We've been talking to you about, and uh, part of uh, the reason that, that, that they're a part of that is because I believe that people of radical faith get to the point where they reject materialism, and we begin to open our eyes and look to the needs of the world around us. So we're going to talk today about, about hearts. We're going to talk today about what it means to, to get beyond our own perspective of just the things that are around us and look beyond to the other side of the world. A very affluent lawyer, attorney, uh, pulled up in his brand new Lexus, parked it in front of the office, was excited about showing it off to his colleagues, but as he opened the front door, a truck whizzed by and tore the door off. Brand new Lexus. 
The man jumped out of the car. Fortunately, there was a, a, a police officer not far away. He came screeching up behind, lights on. But before he could even ask any questions, the attorney already out of his car is ranting and raving and talking about how this was his brand new Lexus. He'd only had it a couple of days. He talked about and, and went on about uh, how no auto body shop would ever be able to put it back together again like it was, and he was just mad about it. And finally, the police officer, uh, just kind of uh, you know, surrendered and said, I can't believe you lawyers. You get so caught up with your possessions that you don't, you don't even consider what's important in life. And the lawyer finally stopped and said, well, why do you say that? And the police officer said, because you hadn't even realized that your left arm is missing. That truck came by and he took it off with your car. Oh no, the lawyer screamed, my Rolex. You know, it's true, and I, and I believe, if you've read chapter 6 of the book Radical, uh, I, I, I believe that David Platt's right on when he says there is, a, there is a blindness that the American church, that American Christians, we are blinded by the materialism in our culture. We don't even see it. We, we are so engrossed with it, we are so accustomed to it, that we have become desensitized. And, and we are just used to all the affluence that we have. And what happens is it be causes us to, to, to turn a blind eye to the life and death things that are happening, needs that are happening to millions of people around the world. We don't even see the problem. I heard one preacher tell about an African friend that was here visiting, and he said this, when I came to America, he said, I was stunned that you build houses for your cars. He says, the houses that you build for your cars are nicer, nicer than the houses African humans live in. It's because we have a different perspective. We're just so accustomed to it. Well, in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and 9, if you've got your Bibles, I want you to turn there. Uh, we find here the longest passage in the New Testament where we are addressed on the subject of our money and how we give our money. And what Paul does right here, he encourages us to examine our hearts. He wants us to look at our hearts in this matter and in relationship with our money. And one of the things that he does is he brags on, he calls it the Macedonian churches. Now, uh, very simply, that's probably the church in Philippi and the church in Thessalonica. Both of those he wrote letters to. Both of those churches he was familiar with. And so it's probably those churches that he's talking about their willingness to give. He's bragging about that. And one of, the, uh, of all those churches right there, uh, uh, Paul talks about looking at their heart, looking at, at uh, uh, the important things, and that our giving is not just about uh, money. It's not just a money matter, but that our giving is a matter of the heart. And that God is really looking on the inside, primarily what we do with our money is a matter of the heart. Would you start with me, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and let's read just the first few verses before we get into it. Uh, verse 1 says, And now, brothers, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches. We talked about who the Macedonian churches are, but he says, I want you to know the grace that God has given them. Understand, this, this work of when you and I give, when, when churches give, it is a work of God. It is not something that we just do. It says that it is gr the grace of God and God gives that, that grace. It's something that God is at work within us. He says, verse 2, out of the most severe trial, their overflowing joy, listen to this, and their extreme poverty. How in the world do those two mix? Because your condition, your circumstances, your level of living financially in life has nothing to do with your joy factor. These folks were poor. These folks, folks lived in a place that was far from here, the other side of the world, 20 centuries ago, and it says they gave out of overflowing joy. It welled up in rich generosity. Verse 3, 4, I testify 
that they, were, that they gave as much as they were able and even beyond their ability. They gave beyond what they thought they could because this was a hard thing. Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing themselves first to the Lord and then giving, keeping with us with God's will. This is an amazing story about people who were so generous and you would look at them and say, there is no way that they can do something. There is no way they're in a position to be able to be generous like that. And so we're going to talk about this thing of, of, of hearts. And, and uh, what I love about it is that Paul still encourages churches like this. He says, I want, you to, I want you to give. In fact, here's some of the reasoning behind it. Skip down to verse 13. He says, our desire is not that others might be relieved while you are hard-pressed, but that there might be equality. At the present time, your plenty will supply what they need, so that in turn their plenty will supply what you need. Then there will be quality. As it is written, he who has gathered much did not have too much, and he who gathered little did not have too little. What Paul is saying is that there is a desire. There comes a point when, when you become a, a Christian and your heart changes to the point where you want people to be, you want their level of living to come up. And so what we do is we give of ourselves. We sacrifice of ourselves so that others can, 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 and can, can, can increase in their level of living. We, we, give, we, we, we give sacrificially so that those that are less fortunate might be able to be brought up, it says, to an equal level. That, that's part of the purpose in, 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 in writing this. In fact, if you skip, go back down to verse 9, it talks about this idea of what Jesus has given up for us, that he became poor for our sake. And so Paul just continues with that theme. Would you, he's asking, become poorer so that people around the world will become richer? That's Paul's goal in writing this, that you and I would have hearts that churches full of Christians in places that are not as affluent as us, that you and I would give out of our plenty and help them to have less of a need, unfortunately. Just read this statistic this week. The average church, out of all the money that comes in, out of all the money that they collect in their offerings, only 3% of it leaves the church. 97% of it stays within the wall, stays within the church, is spent on all the things that churches have, the, the fixed costs, but to take care of the needs of members. Only 3% in the average American church leaves the church, goes to missions, goes to benevolence, goes to anything outside of that. That's sad. I, I'm thankful that our church has decided to go way beyond that. In fact, we give 13% just to missions organization. That doesn't include our benevolence. It doesn't include the projects that we do. That is just missions organizations. And so we're well beyond that, but I'm not satisfied with that. Because Paul exhorts us here, take care of those that are in need. Out of your plenty, give. You become poor so that others can be rich. And he talks about the hearts. The hearts of the Macedonian churches and can I just give you a couple of things that I notice as I'm reading through here? Notice that they had eager hearts. They had eager hearts. I read it already in verse 3. It says that they urgently pleaded. I'm sorry, that's verse 4. He says, For I testify they gave as much as they were able, even beyond their ability, entirely, entirely on their own. They urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in the service to the saints. Now, these are the people that we already said are living in poverty, but they're the ones that are urgently pleading. Let us be a part of it. Let us help with that. That would be like at the end of our service, after we've already sang, after we've already done communion and offering and, and the sermon and all that, and we heard about a need and there were some people that said, no, 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 we're not going to leave until we take up another offering. Please, let's take up another offering. 
by the way, never happened to me in a church service before, but that's the kind of eager hearts that they had. They wanted to pass the offering plate again. They pleaded. They weren't giving out of a sense of duty or obligation, but they had seen what God had done, and they were eager to do it. They had eager hearts. They also had surrendered hearts. They had surrendered hearts. Listen to what it says in verse 5. It says, and they did not do as we expected. We understand the expectation. Those folks, they don't have much. They're probably not going to help a great deal. They did not do as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then to us in keeping with God's will. Why were they able to do such an amazing work? Because first, they gave themselves to God. They had surrendered hearts. They had already given up things. They had already, as we talked about in week number one, re-surrendered. They'd said, God, this is all your stuff. And when you yield your life and your resources and your stuff to Jesus Christ, you understand everything belongs to God, and I'm just going to give wherever God leads me to give. They had surrendered hearts. They also had grateful hearts. Now skip down to verse 9. It says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, even though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, so that you through his poverty might become rich. Why were these Christians able to be so generous? It's because they recognized what Jesus had already done for them. They recognized the incredible gift that Jesus had already given for them. He who was already rich became poor. And so they said, it's nothing for us. We are so grateful for that that it is nothing for us to be able to give out of what we have. We may not have much, but we're going to go ahead and give it because we had grateful hearts and they gave sacrificially. They also had willing hearts. They had willing hearts. Verse 12, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to one to what one has, not, in decor, not according to what he does not have. It says they were willing. The willingness was there. They were glad to be a part of that. They were glad to help out. That's really what we're asking in this radical faith is that we would have a, a, a mass of people, a church full of people who would say, this is something that we are willing to be a part of. In fact, I would go as far to say if you feel coerced, if you feel manipulated, if you feel some way that you uh, have to give and you're doing it for the wrong reason, would you just opt out of it? That's not what we're asking. We're looking for willing hearts that would say, this is what God is calling us to do. We've asked you all along to say, God, what do you want me to do? And so we're looking for willing hearts. Paul says if the willingness is not there, then it's not an acceptable gift to God. Skip over to chapter 9. The, the thought continues, but I want you to notice they also had cheerful hearts. They had cheerful hearts. It says so in verse 7, each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give. Again, here's the idea. Not reluctantly, not to do it under compulsion, not to feel manipulated, not to feel like I have to do this. It's a heart thing. He says, for God loves a what? Cheerful giver. We know that. We've read that. We've seen that. But it sure is hard to do it, isn't it? To be a cheerful giver. That's what God desires from us is that we would have cheerful hearts as we give because it's a heart thing the word comes from the word cheerful comes from you may have heard this before hilarious which is where we get the word english word hilarious and some of you when you have done things like this before when you have entered into a stewardship journey like we've been in before maybe you're right now thinking God, you are talking to me, and I have written down a number, and every time you look at that number, you laugh because you know there is no way in the world that you can do that. It is hilarious to you because that is outrageous. But I think there's something to that. God loves cheerful giving. 
God loves that joyous experience. And I can tell you, when you give that way, it is one of the best experiences that you, you have. When you know that it's God that's providing, when you know that it's God that is leading you, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Can I show you one more attitude of the heart they had? They were testifying hearts. They were testifying hearts, verse 13 tells us. It says, because of the service by which you've proved yourself, listen to this, because of what you've done, because of the gift that you've given, he's telling them, this is what's going to happen. Men will praise God for the obedience that accompanies your confession of the gospel of Christ and for your generosity in sharing with them and with everyone else. Paul is saying, because of your testimony in giving, because of your sacrificial giving, because of your generosity, people are going to be drawn closer to the Lord. Because of what you've done, people are going to praise God. Why? Because actions speak louder than words. You know, when the world looks at the church, when the world looks at us, they don't understand everything that they see. They, 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 they look at the church and, and it's completely different for them. They don't understand the Lord's Supper. They don't understand what it means when we come together and we sing worship songs. They, they don't get all that stuff. The world doesn't understand the, understand the preaching, the gospel, but what the world does understand is money. And when you and I relinquish money, when we give up money, when we're sacrificial with our money, people take notice. They have no choice but to sit up and take notice because it's an awesome testimony for God. Giving, your giving, my giving, is a matter of the heart. And that's why there in verse 7, it says, you should give what you have decided in your heart to give. That's part of why we've drawn out this process of saying, we want you to make a commitment to our radical faith stewardship journey. And we're all going to come together two weeks from today, and I'm going to ask everyone, everyone in our church, to make a commitment that day that over this three-year period, we are going to give gifts over, above, and beyond our regular giving. But we want it to be something that you have decided in your heart. Something that you have gone to God with, that you have decided, and for some of you, it will be the first time that you've experienced being sacrificial. For some of you, you come and you put some money in the offering plate and you participated, and, and thank you for doing that. But for some of you, this will be the first time that you have considered doing something that is a sacrifice on your part. For some of you, this will be the first time that you will become a tither. Because you give some now, but because you're going to add on to that, you're going to become, in, in that level, that 10% level, you'll become a, a tither, giving a percentage of your income back to God. And, and God is going to bless that. In fact, we're going to look at the promises here in just, in just a minute. The issue that we come up to, the issue that Paul addresses here, is the one that we continue to come back with. Even in our incredible affluence, we are guilty of saying, oh, we don't have, we just don't have any money to give. We just don't have any money to give. And the temptation for us is even in our affluence to say, well, I've got so many commitments and I've got so many things going on. I've got so many responsibilities that, that I, I just can't give. And the temptation is to see, well, my participation isn't as important or my participation isn't significant. And so I'm not going to participate. I'm going to opt out of this thing because I don't have any money to give. I don't have, in other words, any extra m income that I can part with. And can I just remind you of a little lady that Jesus witnessed and pointed out to his disciples who put in only two little coins, the widow's mite, you know the story. 
And everybody else is dumping in great big sums. Of, and it's clinking as the, as the coins go into the coffer. But this little widow put what looked like was nothing in the offering. And Jesus pointed it out to his disciples, not because of the amount, but because of the sacrifice. Not because of the huge amount that she gave, but because Jesus said for her, that was a true sacrifice. And that's what God uses. And in fact, that's what God blesses. There are some of you here, maybe, that have a heart for doing some of the things that we've been talking about. Some of you have a heart for things like, we need to pay off the debt, we need to get that behind us. Some of you have a heart for things like the ministry that Paul and Mickey are doing in South Africa. And there are some of you that have the ability to write a large check that would just take care of that need or for the need in North Africa and just say, you know what, let's, let's just do it. Let's be over with. Let's get it done with. I have a heart for that, and I want to take care of that. Because here's what happens. When you, when you give like that, your heart for those places increases. You, you know, we've, we've, with the video, tried to, tried to give a visual this is where South Africa is. This is that we've, we've tried to picture it for us because it often can just be some other place on the other side of the world and we, we, we have no idea what it's about. But when you and I sacrifice and we start giving some of our money to places like that and to the kids that live there, then our heart follows. Here's what common sense tells us. Common sense tells us that where your heart is, determines where your money goes. I have a heart for this, and so I'm going to send some money there. And that may happen on occasion. But Jesus says, no, 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 the opposite is true. In fact, he says it in Matthew 6, 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You may have a heart for something, and you send some money, but Jesus says more often what happens is you send some money someplace, and your heart is going to follow along with it. And you're going you're to have an increased interest, and, and you're going to be thinking. Your thoughts are going to be there. You, you want to have a greater interest in mission. You want to have a greater heart for people like Paul and Mickey and for the orphans of South Africa. We don't have to go any further. I can tell you what to do. Just get your checkbook out right now. Write a check there because your heart will automatically go where your treasure already is. Now, we talked about hearts, but in this passage, God promises us some things when our hearts start to turn, when we experienced transformed hearts. In fact, there in chapter 9, uh, about verse 8, we're going to come back. Well, in fact, let's read verse 8 and following. It says, And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that in all things at all times, having, listen to this, all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Verse 10. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply, and listen to this, and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion, and through us your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. Can we talk about just a couple of promises in those verses that God makes when you start tuning your hearts to His? When you have a heart like we've talked about, willing hearts, sacrificial hearts, eager hearts, testifying hearts, what happens when you give and your heart starts changing? Here's the first thing. It says God will provide for your needs. God's going to take care of you. God's going to supply. You see, this is primarily a trust issue. What if I commit, what if I give and something bad happens and I don't have enough to take care of myself or my family? really what this is. This is a radical faith. This has really nothing to do with money. 
This whole series is about you and your faith in God and how you can be radical in your faith is to say, God, I'm going to do something that, that, that just doesn't make sense in this world. I am going to give, and I'm going to let you worry about the needs of my life. That's what verse says. He says he will have all your needs taken care of. They'll be provided for. Here's the second thing that we're promised, that God will increase your kingdom role. You, you want to have a greater role in the church and what God is doing around the world? You want to do that? This is how it happens. You start giving like this. You start experiencing a heart like this. And, and verse 11 says that, that, that through that, I'm, excuse me, verse 10 says that God will increase your store of seed and he will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. I would love nothing more for our church to have a bigger role in what God is doing around this world. And this is what happens. It happens when we take on projects like what we're doing in radical faith and says we are going to do something beyond and when we give that way God increases God enlarges our territory then he gives one more promise for us in verse 11 that God will God will bless your generosity God will bless your generosity. He says, you will be made rich on every occasion, and here's the reason for it. You will be made rich in, on every occasion so that you can be generous on every occasion. You will be blessed, God says, because of your giving so that you can be a conduit. In fact, have you ever wondered why you live where you live, and you have the stuff that you have, and why there's people on the other side of the world that don't have the things that you have and don't enjoy the affluence that you enjoy. Have you ever wondered, God, why did you put me here? Why, 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 is that, why did I get that blessing? I can tell you the reason why not. It wasn't so you and I could have bigger houses and enjoy more stuff, and have so many hobbies that we don't even possibly have time to get to them. It is not so we can increase our stuff. The Bible says you have been blessed so you can be a blessing. You have stuff so you can, you can bless other people's life with it. You have purchasing power. You have higher salaries than anyone else in the world because God wants you to bless other people people with it. It's not just so you can have more stuff, but, uh, and that's not a bad thing, but it's so that your stuff and your blessing and your generosity, it's so God can be generous with us. And so that's what we're wanting to do with this radical faith thing, is to take the blessings that you and I enjoy and say, God, help us and bless some other people. I've been giving you a radical faith action point. This is it for the day. Reevaluate your perspective on your possessions. That's what we've been talking about. It's easy for us to be blinded to it because of the culture we live in. Would you reevaluate your perspective on, on your possessions? Open your eyes to the needs of the world around you and then just follow through by reallocating some resources. Reevaluate your perspective. Open your eyes to the needs of the world around you and reallocate some of the stuff, some of the money that you have to those needs. In fact, at the end of the service today, we're going to send you away with a challenge that I'm praying that our staff has been hoping and praying is going to help us all to change our perspective to help us all to open our eyes up just a little bit. Some of you, as soon as you hear about it, some of you, as soon as you read about it, you're going to resist it. Some of you are going to argue with us. Some of you are going to say, well, I don't know. Let's try and figure it out. And you're going to try and, you know, okay, how, let's weigh it. And I'm not sure that's completely accurate. And here's what I'm asking. When you, we get to that point, would you, just, would you just resist the urge to resist, okay? And would you just go with the spirit of it and just say, God, open my eyes. If I need my eyes open, help me not to... Help me not to miss the point here, because that's what's going to happen if you try to argue with it. Help me not to resist the point here, because I think we all need a perspective change. The greatest use of your money 
not to spend it on more stuff, not to acquire more. The greatest, finest use of your money is to spend it on something that will outlast it. That's what we're doing with our Radical Faith series is saying, God, this is what we want to do. We want to share this in such a way that it is going to outlast. It is going to change people's lives. It is going to change people's destiny. It's going to change people's eternities. John Ortberg, in his book, Everybody's Normal Till You Get to Know Them, tells the story about a boy named John Gilbert. John Gilbert had a rare form of muscular dystrophy, and it caused some tremendous problems in his life. He ultimately died at it, died from it at the young age of 25. Every year, John Gilbert lost something. One year, he lost the ability to run. And so he loved sports, but he couldn't play them anymore. One year, he lost the ability to walk in a straight line. And then he was forced to just sit and watch other kids play. One year, he lost the ability to speak, and again, ultimately, he lost his life over it. John Gilbert was one of those kids that because of his special needs, ultimately, he had to have a, 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 an assistance dog that helped him. But because of that, just all the kids made fun of him. He was always being bullied, always being tortured by other kids, especially when the dog came along with him. Just always, He was a down and outer. He was one of those that you would look at and your heart would go out to him because of the great need. One time John got invited to a fundraising dinner. It was one of those deals where you know, they auction all the stuff off and there was something that caught his eye. It was a basketball that had been signed by all the players of the Sacramento Kings. And more than anything else, John wanted that ball. As soon as the bidding started for that ball, his hand went up. Just instinctively, his hand went up. And his mom sitting next to him knew they didn't have the resources to be able to do that, gently pulled his arm down. And they listened and they watched as the price for that basketball just went up and up up and out of sight uh, more than any other of the auctions certainly more than the basketball was worth until finally the bidder the bidding stopped and a man from the back who had obviously bought it started walking on his way up and he claimed the basketball but instead of walking back with the basketball he walked across the room and he put that basketball in the thin small hands of this young man John Hands that would never dribble the ball. Hands that would never pass it to a teammate. Hands that would never shoot from the foul line. And hands that would cherish that ball until they died. The man at that auction, it says, as people saw what took place, John says they, there were people that were weeping, there were people that were applauding. And he goes, I was astonished by it. It, 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 it caused, to, caused us all to kind of well up and to uh, notice the, the generosity of this man. And, 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 and we were so excited about it. And he says this. This was his concluding thought. He said, through the generosity of one man, God's presence and love was made real to John. You know, my, my heart, when I read a story like that, it, it just warms up over a basketball. Can you imagine when we do some of these projects we're talking about, can you imagine feeding and clothing and housing orphan kids, helping kids that are so disabled and have physical handicaps that they can't function in society, but helping them to come along, ultimately hoping that their families are going to get involved in a church. Can you imagine the presence and the love of Jesus that we're sharing when we're generous that way? Father, we thank you that you are a loving God, that you love and you care for us, God, that we see a glimpse of your heart, and I'm praying, God, that you're going to help us to have eager, willing, surrendered, grateful, testifying hearts. 
God, would you do a work within us? We give you permission to do that. And God, I'm praying that we are going to, out of what we have, be sacrificial and give to those that have need so that your presence and love can be known. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen.